This is one of those unique stories that if you would, uh, as a child, you uh, read this and you would say, what's all that about? That's, why would that even take place? And you, it's kind of a very unique story. I remember as a, as a child, we'd go over to my grandparents' house every once in a while. They lived in Holton, Kansas, and, and we didn't have a lot to do as a child there. So uh, she had this big old Bible that was out on the, on the table, and, and uh, we really didn't read the Bible a lot, but I would look through the pictures of the Bible. And in the middle of her Bible, they had a picture of this, of this young boy, golden hair, laying down on an altar with wood underneath him, and, and this old man, white-haired old man, with a knife standing over this young boy. But the neat thing about the picture, they had an angel that was over the man with his hands over the man's hands guarding the knife. And underneath it was the caption of Abraham and Isaac. And thinking about that, and I heard the stories, and I, I said, why would God ask Abraham to do that? And in our mind in our flesh, we would think that is so almost ridiculous that God would ask to do that. And so today, we want to ask some simple questions, and we want to figure out what all this is all about. And is it that simple that God just said, Abraham, I want you to do this? Is there a bigger purpose for that? We're in a series called Back to the Basics. We're going over simple Bible stories. We're talking about those stories, and then we're going to try to give you some application to those stories. So uh, I hope this works for you. So the first point is uh, God tests his children. God tests his children. Now let's look at verse, 20, verse 1 in chapter 22. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son. Now that word only, it doesn't mean a singular person. It means the unique promised one. There's two times that word has been used, and that word was used about Jesus being the only begotten, the unique promised son, and this point where God promised Abraham a son. He promised him uh, in chapter 15, you, you were 75 years of age. I give you this promise that your nation will be great, and I promise you that you will have a son. And now it's 15 years later, and, and now she's finally having a son. So it's, it's a unique person, a promised person. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. That's very important. Of one of the mountains I will tell you. Mount Moriah is right in the center of Jerusalem. It's where the, the dome of the rock is. The, in Jerusalem, when you look in there, you see this beautiful temple. It has this gold temple. That is right on Mount Moriah. It's a beautiful place. It's a holy place. When you walk in, you take your shoes off because it's a, it's a, it's a holy site for Islam. It's also a holy site for Jews. So it's a holy site. So we take our shoes off and we would honor that. And we look in there and we actually see the, the top of Mount Moriah. And it's so important to Islam because that is where custom says that... Um, uh, when the Islamic people would... Uh, would come in, they would worship, because at that time, that's where Muhammad stepped on that rock before he went into heaven. So it is a very holy site for Islam. It's a holy site for Jews and Christians, because that is the site where it is said that Isaac was at the altar, and Abraham was tempted, and not tempted, was tested by God. Now, where I think it's going to be unique is that story where it says, Offer in one of the mountains, which I will tell you. There's two mountains on that mountain range. The first mountain is Mount Zion. It's on the left-hand side, about a half a mile away from Mount Harib. And on the other side, about a half a mile away through the valley, is a mountain called Mount Calvary. He said, go to the mountain range of Moriah, and I will tell you which mountain to go so they were at the foot of the mountain. It was a three-day journey. It was, they were at the foot of the mountain, and they started seeing exactly what God had in store for them. 
When you look at what God is doing within our lives, now it came to pass after these days that God tested Abraham. Tested. Now, God only tests certain things and certain people. He tests the best. He didn't test Lot. He didn't test Sarah. He tested Job. He tested Abraham. Sometimes when we are going through tests, it is because God has a plan and a purpose for your life. See, if, if God doesn't stretch us, if God doesn't do things for us, it's by our nature that we will stay complacent. It's by our nature that we will do what we want to do. But sometimes God wants to do bigger things. Sometimes God wants to do something within our life that's bigger than what we could ever do by ourselves. And sometimes God has to say, I am going to test you. Now, the difference is, God tests, Satan tempts. Okay? Got to remember that. God tests, Satan tempts. And sometimes we have to say, is this of God or is this from Satan? Am I being deceived? Am I trying to do something that Satan wants me to do or I'm doing what God wants me to do? And the only way that we have to know that is to filter through the Word of God. We have to filter through the Word of God. So when Abraham is tested, he is tested and he said, I want you to take your son, your unique son, your son that just three chapters earlier, I promised you that your son Isaac will have descendants as much as the stars and the sea. You are going to have a great name, a great heritage. But why now? Why, why would God, after he promised his son Isaac, why would he ask him to sacrifice him? I believe when God tests his children, there's two areas that he tests us in. The first, um, go to a new place. Um, he never keeps us where we are. When we are tested, when God puts things within our life, when God wants us to move off center, he puts within our life testings. Sometimes they're fires. Sometimes we're saying, what in the world do I do? How in the world do I go? Well, I don't understand. And when we go through the fire of testing, and when God starts putting things within our life, and we're saying, I absolutely have no idea what I'm doing, how to do it, but I want to follow after you. He always puts circumstances, situations in our place. That when we have no idea what to do, we have to rely on God. And when we rely on God and we follow after his tent, what we have is we have the blessings of God. We have to go to new places. We never stay at the same place. So if you look at your life and you think God is testing you, you think there's things going on in your life and you're saying, God, what are you trying to teach me? What is all this all about? I would say that what you have to do is you have to look at and evaluate what is it that God wants you to grow in? What is it that sometimes we are complacent in? What is it that maybe we are taking to ourselves and not giving it to God? Because in this entire chapter, God is trying to say, I want you to give to me the greatest thing that you have. I gave you a promise. I gave you a gift. And it's obvious that you love your son. It is something that you desire. I want to make sure that what you want the most, you're going to give to me. So the second point is give up what is the most precious to you. If you are being tested, what we have to understand is God tests his children. And what we have to do is we have to give up, give over to God. What is the most precious to us? If we can't give what God wants, God cannot bless us to a point that he can move us to where he wants us to go. So on that mountain, Mount Moriah, on the left-hand side, we have Mount Calvary. <coughs> Upon one of those mountains, I want you to go. Here's what's the unique thing. Um, in verse 3 it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning, and saddled his donkeys, 
And he took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, it's funny, it says the third day. There's something else happened big on the third day. Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and the lad and I will go yonder and worship and do what? And we'll come back to you. I thought he was going to sacrifice his son on the altar. I thought God told him that you're going to sacrifice your son on the altar. I thought God said, I want you to go to Mount Moriah and I want you to sacrifice your son on the altar for me. Did he think God was going to wink at it? Did he think, well, you know, I, as long as I go through the motions, as long as I act like I'm going to do it, as long as I do what I'm supposed to do, but he, surely God won't make me do something that I really don't want to do. Surely not. We will come back to you. We'll come back to you. We're going to go worship. And then we're going to come back. I believe there's a couple things that Abraham had faith in. Number one, he had faith in the plan. He had to have faith in the plan. He had to understand what God was going to do within his life. And the plan, I think, is very unique. When you look at the plan, he went up on the mountain. He found the altar. He's talking to his son. He said, uh, Isaac, Isaac's probably 16, 17 years of age now. Abraham's probably 115, 116 years of age. And Isaac said, Dad, I see the wood and I see the fire, but uh, I don't see the sacrifice. And God communicated a very open way to Abraham and said, this is what I need you to do. And Abraham told Isaac, God will provide. God will provide. When God provides, gives provision. The word provision is a very unique word. Pro means active and vision means sight. When Abraham said, God will provide, in the midst of of our test. Pro means God is active and he sees. God knows what you were going through. He knows what you're in and he knows what you will do. God has a proaction to your life. He understands provision. I am active. I am here. I see where you are. I see where I want you to go. I'm going to test you and I want to know that when you make your choice, I am going to give you the provision that you need to have. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to help you in every step of the way. And Isaac, 16-year-old boy. Now, a 16-year-old boy, that, it's not a 16-year-old boy that plays video games all day. This is a 16-year-old boy that cuts firewood. This is a 16-year-old boy that herds cattle. This is a 16-year-old boy that understands what work is. I mean, he could play some football. I mean, he was, he's probably a stud. Dad was 116 years old. I mean, as, as close as what we have, he's kind of he's like Al, okay? He's like 116 years old. That's, that's, his, that's his, the age group right there we're talking about. So um, we have a 16-year-old boy, and we have a 116-year-old man. Now, I bet that 16-year-old boy, that 16-year-old boy probably could have taken the 116-year-old man. What are you talking about, Dad? There is absolutely zero way I'm going to let you bind my legs, bind my hands, and put me on that altar. And it's not going to happen. But here's Isaac's heart. Isaac saw who Abraham truly was. He was a man of God. He was a man that spoke to God. 
He saw Abraham's life. He heard God's blessing upon his life. He understood that Abraham, his father, was following after God, and he saw his heart, and he allowed Abraham, his father, and he was submissive to his father because he saw what his father was all about. A righteous man. A man that wanted to do what God wanted him to do. So Abraham bound Isaac and laid him on that altar. He bound him and laid him on that altar. Put the wood. And all of a sudden, when he was ready, he put his hands with his knife and he was ready to sacrifice. And out of heaven, the angel of the Lord says, Stop. Stop. Don't touch the boy. Don't harm the boy. Because now I see your heart. And I see that you're willing to do everything that I've asked you to do. I'm sure. Amen. That was, that was close. That was in the nick of time. But see, we see things with the physical eyes. We see things that what we see, we see the physical aspects. We do not see the spiritual side. And God had opened up the veil of heaven. And the angel of God was watching and saw everything that was taking place. And he saw deep within the heart. He didn't see the action he saw the heart of Abraham. And he knew that Abraham had already turned over Isaac to God. Now listen to this. If you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. This is the New Testament perspective of what Abraham did back in Genesis chapter 22. This is how I can say that this is why Abraham can say, we will come back. We will worship, and then we're going to come back. It says this, by faith. By faith. This is, by faith is saying, I understand that I'm going to take a step out and I don't know where I'm going to go. Either I am going to take a step out on a rock that's going to take care of me or I'm going to fall into God's hands. Either way, I have to have faith. I do not know what tomorrow has in store. By faith means I have to totally trust in God. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises has about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned. Okay, that's a big word. Abraham reasoned. In other words, he looked and he saw what God told him. Isaac will be your heir. And out of Isaac, your offspring will be as many as the stars, as be as many as the sand. He looked at the promises of God and he said, God cannot lie. He looked at the promises of God and said, how could this be if I do this? What is the reasonable outcome if I sacrifice my son that God promised that said that my descendants will be as many as the stars, as many as the sand? How could this be? He looked at it, he processed it, and here is his conclusion. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did raise Isaac back from the dead. What's all that mean? That means he had so much power that he understood that God would raise Isaac from the dead. That's what his heart was. And he knew that as long as he trusted in God, God will provide. God would still, if I did it, God had a plan and God cannot lie. And he promised me and I will fulfill my promise no matter what. And whatever I do, However I go, if I do what God has called me to do, God will give me provision. He will actively see and take care of what I need. If I follow God's will, God will take care of me every step of the way. We have to understand God has a plan. And through that plan, God will provide for us and through us. But we have to understand that that's a very unique story. See, the whole issue that we take care of today. We have, a, we have a spiritual war going on right now. If you want to call it a holy war, we can call it a holy war. But Abraham had two sons. 
two sons, one Ishmael and one Isaac. And Ishmael is a, is a descendant of into the Islamic religion. Isaac is a descendant into the Jewish religion, or we can call that Christianity. And right there is the, is the crux of, of what our issues are of our Islamic Christian wars. What do we do with that? And it's all because when we look at what we need to do, we have to trust in God. In Genesis chapter 15 and 16, it says this. He said, God promised Abraham his son. And in that son, that we are going to have a nation. And the nation is going to be great. And he said then, he said, whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. Abraham is the father of the Jewish religion. Father of Christianity, if you would. And in that, we make the country of Israel, the Jewish state of Israel. And God has blessed that country more than any other country. He has absolutely taken care of them and blessed them. A little sliver of land, God has provided and taken care of them. And he has blessed them above measure. And he has said, God said in Genesis chapter 15 and 16, if I bless you and those that bless you, I will bless. And those that curse you, I will curse. So that's why it's so important. It's not a promise to Abraham. It's a promise to us. It's a promise to anyone that stands up and blesses God. And see, I want God's hand on me personally. I want God's hand upon me culturally. And how do I do that? I have to pray that we stand on the side of God's blessing. Whether we agree with everything a country does is not the issue. The issue is we pray for God's blessing upon them, and we want God's blessing upon us. And we cannot deny we cannot deny in the United States of America that God's hand has been upon us and he has blessed us, he has blessed you. We, all you have to do is go on a mission trip and go to any other country and you see how God's blessing is upon us more than any other country that's, that's ever been around except for the country of Israel. We have to stand on that side. It's all on that crux. So in, in the third point is great blessings result from obedience. Great blessings our result of obedience. Verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, that I have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sand in which the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies." In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And there Abraham dwelt there in Beersheba. Because of your blessing, because of you understanding my power and because of the test and you've succeeded in honoring me, I want to honor you. So a half a mile away, there's this mountain called Mount Calvary. Mount Calvary. Here, Isaac takes the wood that he cut and put it on his back and they go up this mountain. Uh, you know, it doesn't say which mountain. It says, offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Do you know what God does? God knows what took place. God knows what is taking place. God orchestrated Genesis chapter 22 the same way he orchestrates John chapter 16. God orchestrated. Abraham walks up the mountain with wood on his back. Goes up this mountain. We call it Mount Calvary. Takes the wood off his back. Lays on this altar. Abraham his father, about ready to crucify. The angel stops him. God provided a substitution for Abraham and Isaac. It was a ram stuck in a thicket. God provided. And aren't we so happy when we're telling the story that God gave Isaac a substitution for dying? We say, thank God. 
that that took place. But aren't we also so happy that God didn't find a substitution when Jesus was on that mountain? Because Jesus was that lamb. Jesus was the lamb that God provided for you and I. If it wasn't for Jesus, we would still be in our sins. God provided for Isaac a ram. God provided for you the lamb. The lamb, the one that is worthy to be praised. The word of God in the flesh was Jesus and he came to die for our sins. On that very same hill, on that very same hill, God provided something that we could not do. We could not even fathom. We can't fathom how we would sacrifice a son. But God wanted to see what is it that the deepest, most important part of your life. To Abraham, it was a son. A 116-year-old man had about a 16-year-old boy that was promised by God. It was so important to him. He loved him. He wanted to protect him. He wanted to take care of him. And then God wanted to see this. What is it that is so important to you that you will not give to me? See, we do this in church all the time. Somebody has a little baby and, and they, they call me up and say, Pastor, can you do a, a baby dedication? So we bring the baby up on the platform and I try to hold the baby without the baby crying. Most of the time it doesn't work and the baby's crying away. But the idea of the baby dedication is this. This family, they believe in Christ and they're saying, I want my child to be God's. I know this child is not saved. He's protected, but he hasn't given his life to Christ yet. He, he or she is going to be dedicated to God. So what we want to do is we want to train up our child in the way he should go so when he's old he won't depart from it. But we, when we dedicate this baby, it's easy to dedicate a baby when the baby's three months old. Okay, sometimes, okay, just take care of the baby. And, and it's easy to do that when the child is innocent and young. But maybe not so much when the child is 22 years old. 15 years old. And we try to protect that child when God is wanting something else for that child. And that child has to go through something or do something that you're not in control of. We have to remember that child is God's. That child may have to go through things because we have given that child our responsibility. God gave that child to us and we gave that child back to God and God has given us the responsibility of training that child. But that child may do some stupid things and who's going to take care of that child? You can't be with that child 24-7. It is God's child and God will move. He will discipline those that he loves if he needs to. But that child that you gave to God, maybe he's or she is doing something wrong. God will protect. Maybe that child is called to do something that you don't want them to do. God will provide. That child has to be God. So when you say, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? You need to pray. The most prized possession that you have could be your child. The most prized possession you have is not your job. It's not the resources that you have. The prized possession we have is our children. And just like Isaac, he was Abraham's child, a unique child. He had to give that child to God. And God, whatever you want. I know that you have the power to provide. I know that you have the power to raise from the dead if need be. But my child is yours. We look at what we see. God sees the bigger picture. The provision. He sees. He's active in our life. He sees what we need. When we see what God can do and we see all the way back from the promises of God, what is it that we need? What is it that we have? What is it, if we can look at Abraham and Isaac and say, what's, what's this story all about? It's very simple. It was a type of Christ. That Abraham is the type of God. That Abraham was going to sacrifice his only unique son. God sacrificed his only unique son. And what's he ask? He just says, what is it that's keeping you from him? If he is your sacrifice, if he is your payment for sin, why do you hold it on to? In our culture today, what we hold on to, we hold on to a lot of different things. But God says, listen, we come and we can worship and we can raise our hands and we can enjoy church 
And we have the freedom to do so because of the salvation that Jesus Christ provided. But God looks deeper than us singing songs or reading scriptures or listening to sermons. God looks deeper, just like he did with Abraham. He looks deep within the heart, the intent. He says, we're going to come to the mountain and we're going to worship. And then we are going to come back to you. So when you are tempted and when you are tested, when, when the trials come in and the fire happens, what do you do? We all have been tested. We've all been tempted. We've all had trials within our life. And what do we do? Sometimes we stick our head in the sand and say, oh, I just hope it goes away. Sometimes we just deal with it and, and try to run away from it. Sometimes we just get ahead of God. And see, even Abraham and Sarah got ahead of God, and that's how Ishmael was born. Sometimes we hear God's promise and we say, well, let me fix this. Let me, let me do something. Let me, let me do something for God. Surely God doesn't have this thing figured out. I think God needs my advice on this. So we get ahead of God and God says, no, stop. When I gave you a promise, I cannot lie. The promise I give to you will come around. You have to trust in me. Abraham and Sarah didn't trust in God, so that caused a major problem. He was tested again. He was tested again, and he came out with faith. He came out true. What is it, what is it in your life that God is testing you with? What is it that he's breaking you with? What is it when you're by yourself and you're struggling and you fall on your face before God? You say, God, I need you. I need you to take care of this one. I need you more than ever right here, right now in my life. I need some help. And more than anything else, what God says, I want you to be honest. I want you to be honest with the conviction of God. I want you to be honest with the testing that I'm putting you in. Because I have confidence in you, I test the best I have a plan for you. I have a will for you. I want you to get out of your laziness, move out of complacency, and I want you to be faithful to me and give to me what's meaningful to you, what you are holding on to, whether it's your sin or whether it's your life or whether it's your children. I need you to give them to me so I can take care of it. Just like just like uh, uh, Abraham was told by God, I'm going to make you a descendant. It's going to be great. And whoever curses you is going to curse you. Who's going to bless you is going to bless you. I am going to make that happen to you. When we give something to God, God's hand is on it. God will protect it. God will provide for it. And God will do great things for it. But it has to be out of your hands and into God's hands. If you keep it in your hands, God is not in control of it. Whatever it is that you're struggling with, whatever it is that you hold on to, whatever it is that you love, it's got to be given to God. If it is not given to God, it's yours. But the sweetest thing is, when you give whatever it is to God, God wraps his arms around it. And God protects what you give to him. I don't know how many times I've had the privilege of somebody uh, moving into a new home or somebody starting a new business and they said, Pastor, can you just come over to the house and before we move in and, and just do a prayer of dedication? This, I want this house to be God's. Or they go into their new home and, and we go in there and we get around the family and, and we have a prayer of dedication that this house will be blessed by God. And they said, whatever, whatever we need. If you have a missionary coming in and, and you want them to stay someplace, they call us up. This house is God's. Whatever God wants to use it for, he can and they are blessed. Whatever we give to God, God will bless. When you give your life to God, God will bless it. How does he ultimately bless it? Is when you give your life to Christ, you have the assurance of salvation and you have your assurance of heaven forever. But in your life right now, you have God's peace that passeth all understanding. What is it? I believe the number one thing that God told us to give to him is self. I think we get in our way more than any other obstacle in my life. 
I am my biggest enemy because of my pride. Whenever I am going through an issue, my first issue, my first thought, I'm sadly to say, is not what God thinks. What would I look like? What would somebody say? If they knew that I had that problem, would they look at me funny or would they say something to me? And you know what? That should never come across my mind. What should come across my mind is, God, I'm sorry. God, they are not going to protect me. You are the one that's going to protect me. They are not going to forgive me. God, you are the one that's going to forgive me. So when we have an issue and a test within our life, our biggest issue is are we willing to come to the throne of God, look at our life, become open to him. Listen to this one verse, and I'll, I'll close after this one verse. But this verse is an awesome verse. James 1.12. Blessed is the man who pers perseveres under trial. While when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When you have stood the test, when you stood up in the midst of the test and you said, God, my life is yours. My issue are yours. My brokenness is what I want more than anything else. I need to be broken so I can be reliant upon you. And until God breaks me, until God puts me in a place where I only can depend on him, I'm dependent on self, and I fail. Kids fail, parents fail, churches fail every day because we try to do it ourselves, and when we do it ourselves, we fail. But here's what God says. Come to me, all of you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. I will give you comfort. I may break you. I may even mold you, but you are my vessel that I have purchased through the blood of Jesus Christ. And because I have purchased you with the blood of Jesus and you are my child, let me love you. Let me move you. Let me bless you. Let me take you to where I want you to go. Because if I love you and you trust me, where could we go if the heart of the individual and the heart of God collide? What could we do? What could God do for you and with you? The difference, we have to get self out of the way. We come to a church service and corporately we sing songs. We, some of us raise our hands and some of us sing and some of us stand there like we can't sing and it's all corporate. Yeah, that's okay. It's worship. God doesn't want to hear our worship until he first hears our heart. And once he sees and hears our heart, Abraham didn't have to stab Isaac because God saw the intentions of his heart. And once we give our heart, our life to God, then God does the saving, the providing, the taking care of. We call it the blessing. We must give our hearts, not only our salvation, but our hearts to Christ. How do we do that? By prayer. I'm going to invite you. Not because anybody else cares. Not because somebody else is watching you. Not because you want to be seen by anybody else. I want to have an opportunity for you to pray to God. In the testing that you're in, the trial that you're in, the brokenness that you're going through, even a temptation that you are failing in, the only person that can help you in your test, in your trial, or in your temptation is God. And the bended knee before God is saying, Lord, I am not in control I have to surrender everything that I have. Just like a little child, I dedicate my life to you. And I need you more than ever to heal me, to direct me, to teach me, to comfort me. I can't do it on my own. 
And when we find out that we can't do it on our own, God does it for us. That is comforting. That is sweet. So the struggle, the trial, the temptation, leave it at the altar. Give it to God. Let God direct you and move you like never before. And it'll be the best time of your life. If you don't, it is the same old, same old, same old. Never wins. Let God win. I'm going to ask you to please stand to your feet. We're going to sing this song, and I'm going to ask you, not anybody watching you, nobody's going to come pray with you. God wants to hear your heart. Spend some time just talking to God. You got a trouble? You got issues? You got issues going on? Talk to God about them. Because God wants to take care, minister to, work with every one of our issues. Let's sing this song.